Amen. How many of you this morning believe that God has come to awaken? I am talking about you. I am. I promise. I promise we're going to. How many of you believe that God, that God wants to awaken the hearts of people? How many of you believe that God has called you to be a part of that process? Amen. Well, I know Pastor Dan feels that way. I don't know about the rest of you. How many of you believe that God has purposefully placed you where you are so that you can reach somebody that needs Jesus Christ? You know, until we, until we truly get a hold of that, it's, it's difficult for, for the world to really understand what it is. The Bible says that the world will know who you are by your love. Amen. Now, part of that is loving one another. Amen. So I want you to stand up real quick. Everybody all across this place, stand up. And I want you to find about three people. I want you to high five them, shake their hand, hug their neck, whatever it is that you feel comfortable doing. And just tell them, hey, I love you in Jesus. Amen. There you go. See, it's important, it's important to love one another. Amen? Amen. Now, y'all can be seated for just a second. Now, one of the wonderful, wonderful things about being a part of the body of Christ is that, is that there is that bond that we have with one another, that we love each other. And I was looking out this morning, and I tell you what, I, my heart just leaped inside of me when I looked out and I saw Cindy here this morning. Two weeks ago, she had surgery, and she is here today. Cindy, it is such a great honor to have you here this morning. We love you. I'll tell you what, it's marvelous. It's just marvelous to see what the Lord is doing. And I know that she's on a journey, but you know what, Cindy? You're not alone in your journey. Amen. You have a body of believers, people that love you, friends that God has surrounded you with that's going to continue to help you as you journey along. And I tell you, that's, that's, that's where we really see the love of God. Amen. And that's the marvel of that. But then the Bible also tells us that we're to love others. Amen. And so there's a world out there, there's a world out there that needs the love of God. And the, the world that we, that we live in, the world that we live in is a world that is dead to the things of Christ. Amen. And, and what needs to happen is that there needs to have a transformation that takes place where the, the dead come to life. Amen. Now, there's, I know that everybody probably has seen or heard and, and uh, you know, we kind of purposely kind of lined up this month and I feel like that the Lord directed us, but um, you probably have seen the series that's on uh, the television called The Walking Dead. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, no big deal, uh, uh, because it really isn't that big of a deal to me. But for some people, there's like this whole cult group that's rising up. Uh, one of the first, uh, one of the first horror movies I ever went to uh, was the uh, Night of the Living Dead. It was produced in 1968. Anybody ever remember that movie? Anybody? Yeah. How, how many of you want to say that you went to see it? I know because in 1968, you know, church people didn't go to the movies. Uh, I didn't go to the movies to see it. They actually showed it at one of the high schools. And it was actually the very first date that I ever went on in my entire life. And uh, my, uh, my, my, I, talk, I convinced my dad and my mom that, that since it was in the high school, it really wasn't like going to the movies. Uh, yeah, some of you get what I'm talking about because some of you remember... You know, and in in, in, when I grew up in church, movies were off limits, all right? There was, nothing, there was nothing there for Christian people, so don't go to them. It was like, ah, you know, you had to, you couldn't, and, 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 and then to, to go to a movie that was uh, kind of what you call a, I guess, they, I guess those are considered like B-rated horror movies, I guess is what they, 
They have those. And uh, so I went to this movie, and uh, uh, my, 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 this, this young, I can't even remember her name, isn't that terrible? Uh, my first, very first date I ever went, I can't even remember the girl's name. <coughs> Uh, she's probably watching this on the web, you know, and she's probably thinking, hey, I know that guy. Hey, I remember that day. And he can't, I'll probably get a message from her or something like that. You know how that goes. It's kind of out there somewhere. But uh, I, I, I went to this movie and, and I was scared to death. Not about the movie, but I was thinking God's going to strike me dead. I'm watching the movie and it's not on my television at all. This is not good. But, uh, but I got through it. And uh, didn't didn't get struck dead or anything like that. But that was my first my first experience with uh, with going to that. And 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 I, I was thinking about this this season that we're in because this is considered by so many people considered a uh, a demonic holiday, uh, Halloween. And, and everybody you know they they talk about October. Oh, you know it's a bad time and and everything. And and I I, I couldn't help but think you know. We need, to, we need to be a little bit more um, aware of our surroundings as believers. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, it's really, you know, if, I don't know, was anybody in this room, anyone born on October 31st? Anybody? Who was born on October 31st? Somebody's pointing at somebody. Celia was born on October 31st. Come here, Celia. Come up here, honey. Come on up here with me. Now, now, now I want to ask you something. You see this young lady right here? Isn't she beautiful? Now, this is what God does on October 31st. You understand? This right here, isn't she a doll? Amen. 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 I call her, I call her our doll baby. She always she says, I'm not a baby, but she'll always be our doll baby. Thank you. She ought to roll her eyes. You see that, Grandma? You can go ahead and you can go sit down. But thank you. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Now, now, there's some people that would say that, well, that day is the devil's day. Now, how could that be the devil's day when God does something that gorgeous? Amen? Because every day is the Lord's day. Amen. Amen. And I always tell people, I say, you know, if you're going to go to that extreme, then you're going to have to quit calling Monday, Monday. Because Monday is dedicated to the moon god. Thursday is dedicated to the, the god of thunder. That's Thor's day. That's where we got the name Thursday from. You understand? You would, you would, literally, you would literally have to change everything. Okay? But God did that through His Son, Jesus Christ. Everything changed when Christ came. Dead people started walking again. They came to life. Amen. And, and the thing that I want us to, to get a hold of during this series this month is to recognize that, that one, there are some, some things we need to know about death, but we need to co- focus our attention on life. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. So when we talk about the walking dead, we're going to be talking about some different aspects of that all month long. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the the spiritually dead. Is that all right? Next week we're going to be talking about coming alive in Christ, being alive in Christ Jesus. In fact, I'm so excited about next Sunday. Uh, Probably more excited about next Sunday than I am even about this Sunday. Uh, because next Sunday we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be witnesses of people, young people, children, and adults who have literally died to this world and have come to life in Jesus Christ, and we're gonna witness it through baptism. Amen. Now that's exciting. So if you haven't been baptized, this coming Sunday is your day. Amen. And you need to get ready for it. You need to come. You need to be here and get ready. Bring you a towel. Don't wear white as we heard from the guy on the screen. 
uh, wear, wear something else and, and bring you a towel. We're going to have a great time. We got kids going to get baptized. We got young people going to get baptized. We got adult people going to get baptized. And it's, hey, it's a celebration, amen, because people who were dead have now come to life. Can you give God praise for it right now? Come on, amen. Amen. So all month long we're going to be talking about giving uh, this, this aspect of the walking dead and what does that really mean and how does that really apply to us. So I want you to, this morning, if you have your Bibles or they can put it up on the screen, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look at verse 21 and verse 22. And then I want you to go to Revelations chapter 3. So get, mark your Bible, put your finger in it, put your little tab in there, whatever it is you do to uh, get your Bible ready so that you can move along and, uh, and you can... Uh, uh, and I want to apologize to all of our children this morning. Uh, normally I would have a video up there uh, that I could show you or something that we could do uh, this morning because we have our children's ministries in the sanctuary this morning. And I want you to give our chil- all of our children, if you're, if you're in kids' church, I want you to stand up on the seat. Stand up on the chair. Get up on the chair. There you go. Get up on the chair. There you go. Come on. All of, there they are. Now give all of our kids, come on, let them know you love them. There you go. It's the, it's the one and only time you'll probably ever get to stand on the, on the seat because your parents will say, get off the seats. <laughs> so you can sit down. Thank you. So, and boy, didn't our kids do a great job this morning singing? Amen. I love, I love our children's ministries. I love what children's ministries do. They do every Sunday. And uh, it's exciting when I when I hear what uh, what what uh, uh, Becky and Bill are doing and the and the, and the group. It, it just excites me. I'm really excited because you know um, we're trying to add some new people to uh, to the team. And I am I'm really excited about the fact that che- where's Chelsea and Elvin? Chelsea, and Elvin, stand up, wave at everybody, Amen. Um, you know, Chelsea and Elvin came to me a couple a few Sundays ago and said, you know, we really want to do something in church. And uh, I asked them, I said, well, do you like, one, do you like kids? They said, yeah, we love kids. I said, well, do you like to sing? They said, yeah, we love to sing. Well, Chelsea said she loved to sing. I don't really know what Alvin said. I can't remember what exactly he said. Um, and I said, well, you know what? Kids Church is looking for some people to help in their music and in the worship time. And uh, they'd never done it before, and it's all new to them, and, and it's going to be a challenge for them. But I'm really excited that they're willing to take a step into that challenge. And to say, you know what, I'm going to do something. Amen. You know what? Amen. Amen. That they're willing to invest. You know, they don't even have kids of their own. And they're willing to invest in your kids. Now that's, you know, that, that's huge. You know, the people that work in there, a lot of, you know, a lot of times people do what they do because they love God. And they want to they minister. And I'll tell you what, if you can win a child to Christ... See, I was, a, I, was, I was a child. I was six years old when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. So don't tell me that children can't receive Jesus. And don't tell me that children don't know what it means to serve the Lord. Amen. Because since I was six years of age, I have served the Lord. And can I, can I be honest with you? I didn't always do it right or perfect every time along the way. All right? But I always had a heart for God. From the time I was a young boy. And I'm here today because people invested into my life. My, my father, my mother, teachers, Sunday school teachers. We didn't have kids' church when I was growing up. And so I get really excited when I hear about what goes on in kids' church. So I think, man, if I could do my ministry all over again, I think I would be in kids' church. Amen. I, I'm serious. Because there's something about being in kids' church. There's something about ministering to kids. Because you know what? You can mess up and they still love you. I mess up in here and everybody's saying, boy, that preacher bombed today. They don't know the difference in there. They're thinking, wow, that was pretty cool. He did did all right. And they even laugh at you and with you. Amen. And it's okay. I love kids' church. So it's good to have all of our children in here normally service on Sunday morning is not designed for children it's designed for grown up and uh, so it's a little tough for our kids sometimes to be in the sanctuary and, and moms uh, don't worry about you know chewing them out 500 times because they're not doing what you ask them to 
Just let them be kids. It's okay. Amen. And as long as they don't come running up on the stage on me while I'm preaching, if they do, I might grab one of them or something like that and use them as an illustration. Uh, uh, but, uh, but let them be kids. Amen. Amen. I don't want children to ever hate coming to God's house. Amen. I want our children to love the house of God. I want them to feel like that the house of God is a place where they can relate and they can grow and they can experience the love of God. Amen. Because that's really what it's all about. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians, let's get into the Word of God for a few moments today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's read what the Word says, verse 21. It says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of, of the dead. For as in Adam all died. Can you say all died? Even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Because in Adam all are dead, but in Christ all can become alive. Amen. We want to talk about the walking dead. Today we want to talk about the spiritually dead. And if you have your Bibles, flip over again now. As I said, flip toward the back of your Bible to the book of Revelations. Open them to the third chapter. And I want us to read verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church at Sardis write. Now let me ask you something. Who's this letter going to go to? It's going to go to the church. Everybody say the church. church. All right. Everybody say me. Because that's who he's talking to. He's talking to the church. We're the church. And he says to the church at Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God remember therefore how you have received and heard hold fast and repent therefore if you will not watch I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you you have a few names even in Sardis you have not defiled, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in right, white raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a very, listen, this word here is a powerful, powerful word. Amen. Because this word speaks to the church. And it's interesting because Jesus didn't say, have anything good to say about this church. Do you notice that? He has nothing really good to say about it. He, in fact, when you look at this, and, and, and again, uh, you know, why really should he have something good to say about it? It wasn't uh, really even a church any longer. In fact, the church had kind of died out. It was almost dissipated. It had almost disappeared. And, and, and there were just a few faithful folks holding on to the church. And they had a reputation. Notice their reputation. It says that, that the reputation was that they were alive, but Jesus said they were what? They were dead. They, were, they, they had a reputation of being alive, but really Jesus said, you are actually dead. He wasn't talking about a season of dryness that sometimes we go through. How many of you have ever had a dry time in your, in your walk with God? You ever gone through a dry spell? Ever had a dry spell where it seemed like that, man, you know, nothing I do, nothing, nothing seems to be working for me, nothing seems to be clicking. Uh, I, I'm praying, but it doesn't seem like it's getting higher than the ceiling of the room I'm in. 
everything around me seems to be uh, just kind of moving along and not really nothing really happening that is of any value. There's just a dry season in my life. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about a dry season. That's not, not, not it at all. In fact, uh, th- this is, this, uh, in other words, he's really saying to them that this church has actually disconnected itself from Jesus Christ. And the, here's, the, here's the thing. They were disconnected, but it didn't bother them. Did you hear what I said? They were disconnected, but it didn't bother them. They weren't bothered by it. They just, they just went along being disconnected. Being disconnected wasn't a big deal. They didn't have any issue with it. And so Jesus' words to the church in Sardis are, 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 are important for us to hear because here's the thing that I, I, one of the things that really kind of bothers me as a pastor. I notice that in the world we're living in, church world today, there's a big disconnect. Everything looks alive, but there's a disconnect. They, there's a, a, format, a form of, but there's a disconnect. It appears to be, to the outside looking at it, it's alive. It has all the, 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 the trappings of something alive, but it's dead. We were, we were traveling to Elkhart this past weekend, last weekend, Sunday, those of us were in the car, and I had posed a question on, on Facebook uh, for people to, to ask, just to, to hear what people had to say about it. I, I like to do that because I like to hear what the public, uh, especially in my circle of friends, what they have to say about certain things. And so I, I asked this question, I said, is the church assembled, the church assembled, is its main purpose for believers or is its main purpose for unbelievers? And, you know, when you ask that kind of a question, you know, uh, first people are going to ask me, well, what, what do you think? You know, well, I'm not interested in what I think right now. I'm really more interested in what other people think about it. And so it's interesting, you know, I've got, on one side, I've got some people say, well, the church is for the believers. And then I've got some people over here say, well, the church is, you know, for both. It's for believers and unbelievers and, and things. And so we, we got into kind of a discussion about that. You know, it was an hour and 20 minute drive. And so, uh, uh, you know, you, you put a few preachers in the car and, and uh, you know, you get them to talking. And bless Brother Dave, he was with us. And Tony was with us out there. And, and uh, you know, and I think Tony had his earbuds on. I think he was something. Like, you know, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, you know, because, you know, you get to talking about this. And I like to hear, you know, what other people say about it. I like to hear what other people think about these matters. And so we were just talking about it. And I was asking a simple question that because I really wanted to know. Because one of the struggles I have as a pastor is to try to figure out, do we design church, do we develop church for unbelievers who come? Or is the church actually for believers who come? Well, if you look in Scripture, it's pretty obvious. Church assembled, the body of believers is for believers. It, it really is. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And, 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 and at the same time, the reason I say that is because the, ro- the role of the church, the responsibility of your life and mine, is not what we do inside the four walls of this building. The responsibility we have is what we do when we leave here. The real real issue isn't what we're doing here as much as what we're doing when we leave out of here. Because the truth is, is that we come in here to refuel, if you will, to recharge, to connect, to stay, amen, because there needs to be a connection. Hello? Amen. Because you're going to go out into the world that you live in and you're going to be among a bunch of dead people, a bunch of zombies out there who are completely, completely lost without God. And they don't even know it. And the, the role and responsibility we have as believers is to go into the world and make disciples. That's what the Word of God says. Now somewhere along the way, we have disconnected ourselves from the reality of what church is really all about. We've gotten confused with, you know, with the, with the superficial things such as, well, you know, I don't believe in religion and, you know, and I don't believe in, in rituals and I don't believe in, you know, that I want relationship and things like that. Let me ask you something. How many of you who are in a relationship with your spouse 
have rituals that you do at home. You better believe, if you didn't raise your hand, you're all lying. You're lying. Because you do. You do things the same way a lot of days. Monday something to, how many of you have a garbage day? When garbage has to go out for the guy to, how many of you have that? How many of you, when you miss the ritual of taking the garbage out, you got to wait till the next time? See how much, see how much we talk and we see, we, we get, listen, we get caught in the disconnect stuff. We don't really understand what it really is all about. And what we need to understand is that there's more to being a Christian, more to being a believer in Christ than just what we do on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. So here's what we've done. We have because we, we've got this idea that, well, you know, making disciples, that's a hard thing. Hello? Making a disciple is tough because making disciples means that you're going to have to spend some time with that person. You're going to have to develop a relationship with that person. You're going to have to purposefully put yourself out there for that person. Hello? You're going to have to earn the trust of that person. You're going to have to go through moments of failure with that person. You're going to have to go through all kinds of situations with that individual. Why? Because my goal in life is to bring them into a place where they can know Christ as I know Christ. You're going to have to live as an example to them. Amen? Amen? You're going to have to live up to the standard of the Word of God in front of them. You're going to have to do things the right way when you're with them. You're going to have to speak the right words when you're with them. You're going to have to act a certain way when you're around them. Amen. Especially when they're around their group and you're just invited into the group. Hello? See, it's different when you invite them to church. So in the church, here's what we've done. We think that if we can get the lights right, have the smoke flowing on the floor, have everything on the screen just right, that that will be enough to attract unbelievers to church. In fact, we even have things like this. We have vision statements, mission statements, things that say like the, imper the, the, the perfect church for people who are not. Or a church where unbelievers like to go. Things like that. And what we do is, is we, we, we move around. I'm not saying good, bad, right, or wrong. Don't, don't, don't take away from what I'm saying that, oh, that's all bad. That's not what I'm saying. But here's what I'm asking. Is it possible that we have in the church changed Power for program. Have we changed the message and brought it down to a place where anyone can accept it? Let me ask you a question. When Jesus was with the unbeliever and he hung around them, when he saw a great crowd of people with him, he turned to all of them, and this is the words he said to them. He said, unless you are willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be a part of the kingdom. Right. Now, what do you think people did when they heard that? Sounds like the zombie movie to me. <laughs> I mean, it sounds, like, it sounds like a page right out of uh, the Walking Dead thing, right? If you can't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have no part. And when they heard it, the Bible said that Jesus was just kidding. That he was just, oh, I was just, I was just funning with you. I really didn't mean that. That's not what he said, is it? The Bible says that when they heard that, they said, that's a hard saying. And we can't follow that. 
and they turned and departed from him. And when the multitude had dispersed and the disciples were sitting there, Jesus looked at them and said to them, Are you also going to leave me now? The point is this. Jesus never brought the message down. He always kept the message clear. Amen. He always had a purpose in mind. Always had a very clear message that, you know what? Unless you change to what I'm asking of you, you can't be a part of it. But in today's church world, we ask people things in the, in the, to the degree that says, well, we're not really asking you to make a life-changing decision right now. We just want you to take steps along the way. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. When you come and encounter Jesus Christ, truly encounter Jesus Christ, it will be a life-changing experience for you. End of story. Amen. 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 And here's the thing. Yes, we can do everything we possibly can to draw unbelievers into the house of God. But I'm going to tell you something. That was never the intention of the New Testament church. That was never the, the, never the purpose. We were supposed to go where the dead are and bring them to life in Jesus Christ. That was the goal. Amen. Now, when I look at this word, when I see this word, here's the thing I realize. I realize that this church, this church was dead and they did not know it do you know that there is the potential that you can actually go through all the motions of what it means to be a christian and still be spiritually dead did you know that you can do all the right things and say all the right words and still miss out on what god has because you're spiritually dead amen you say how is that possible it happened here He said to them, I know you. I've watched you. I know you. I know who you are. I know what the reputation is about you. Your reputation says you're living. But he said, I'm just here to tell you, you are D-E-A-D, dead. Or as some would say, D-O-A, dead on arrival. You're dead. You say, well, if that's true, then then what is it that we need to do to be aware of if we are not going to be caught in the same kind of trap of spiritual deadness that the church at Sardis was in? Well, I'll give you a couple of things. Number one, I think here's how you can tell if you're really spiritually dead or you're moving into spiritual death. When you treat your faith like it's a routine and it's not a ritual. When you begin to treat your faith like it's just routine and not a ritual. There are, there are countless ways individuals and churches who, who were once alive in Christ move toward decay and death. Whatever the reason is, I believe this, it boils down to treating Christianity or treating your experience with Christ like it's a series of routines and not, not the ritual. Routine is a life of check making the boxes the minimal obedience of compliances, the thing that I can do, if I can just, I did this today, I did that today, I did this today, I did that today, I went here, I went there. How many of you ever make a list when you do something? Hello? And some of you make a list about going to church. Well, I went to church on Sunday, I did that, I read my Bible today, check. I read, I, I, I said my 10-minute prayer, check. I did this, and it becomes more of a routine in your life. Listen, Ritual is when it becomes meaningful. When there's value and purpose and mission. And watch this. And there's a passion in what you do because of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, if your faith in Christ is more routine than ritual, then you'll inevitably stop making and marking off the boxes. Eventually, I won't check going to church on Sunday. Eventually, I'll replace. Listen, what here, and here's the thing. You can tell when things become routine and it's not really a part of your passion.
Because what happens when it's routine, you will fill your routine with other things that will be routine. And one of the marks, one of the signs that spiritual deadness is coming on your life is when all of a sudden everything else becomes ritual and the things of God become routine. You know that there, there's, there's, there's this, uh, the connection of the heart and the lifestyle that has to happen, especially in a lifestyle of worship of God. And that, that lifestyle produces power and anointing in our lives and in our ministries. And when, listen, when we become disconnected, we are, we and our ministries, listen to me, when we become disconnected, we and our ministry begin to die a slow spiritual death. You know what's interesting about that? Here's what I discover about people when it comes to their spiritual life and it comes to their walk with God, and it comes to their ministry stuff. Here's what I find out. You give up ministry stuff faster than you give up anything else. Why? Because it's just routine. If it was passion, if it was was the ritual of your heart, if it was something that you were valuing, something that you believed in purpose, something that you saw that, that you were on mission, you were on task, you were doing what you know God wanted you to do, it would be much more difficult to do it. But it's easier. Because you know what? Going to work is a ritual. Now don't look at me like, I can still see your faces. You go to work because you like the God of money. So you put it into your life as a ritual. You do it ritualistically. You get up, you set your alarm clock to make sure that you get up in the morning so you can go to your job. In fact, some of you set three alarm clocks because the first one just won't do. And you've got to keep getting them further and further and further away from the bed just so you'll get out of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when it comes, well, you know, pastor, you know, I've got to live. I've got to live, you know, I've got to have, you know, I've I've got to have my car and I've got to have my house and I've got to, you know, I've got to have my, my nice things and I agree. I like my house. I like my car. I like my nice things just like you do. Amen. He said, well, Pastor, you know, it's different for you because, you know, your job is your ritual and your job is be pastor. So it, notice what it says. He talked to the church. That church had a pastor, one of the seven stars that he held, one of the candlesticks that was in his hand. And he said to the church, pastor included, You have an appearance and a reputation of being alive, but you're spiritually dead. We don't like to hear stuff like that. Because we don't want to believe that there actually is that disconnect. And when we, listen, when faced with the reality, I'm sure most wouldn't even want to entertain the idea of even being disconnected from God. And the problem is that we don't start out wanting to be disconnected or insincere in our worship with God. We don't start out that way, but sometimes life happens. Kids, jobs, spouse, finances, friends, all of these things are constantly competing for our attention. They're tirelessly fighting for their spot on our list of priorities. More than that, they're fighting to be number one. Do you hear what I said? They're fighting to be number one on our list. And we spend our days trying to give our attention to these many different things. And before you know it, Sunday comes around and we realize that we've missed one of the most important uh, times that, of the week with God. And here we are. If, if, if anything else, and we feel ashamed or we feel doubtful in the beginning or hurt that we, did, we would do that and we're disappointed in ourselves. And, we're, and we feel like that, that we've let people down and we've let others down. But most importantly, we feel like that we've let God down. And then there's this disconnect between God and me. 
And unfortunately, the plot of the enemy isn't overt. You see, it's exceptionally sneaky. Because, you see, all he knows is this. We've all fallen to the ritual or, or, to ritual or routine. And we all will face it again and again. And here's the thing. How do we overcome this? Because there's this possibility that we just treat our faith, our relationship with God, like it's just one of the other things we have to do this week. The other thing that we look at, you can tell when spiritual deadness is coming along because you see, you will, you're, you're, you're not passionate. You're not passionate about Jesus. Now we talk about passion. Here's the thing. You know, all I can do is, you know, try to relate this. What do you really love? I mean, really love. What is it that you want to spend your time with? You know, I, I love when I, when, I, when I watch young couples that are, that are in love for the first time. It just, I just get so giddy. It's so hilarious. Because it's like, she's just sitting there going, so adorable. Oh, I just love everything he does. Oh, he sneezed. Oh, isn't that cute? Oh, he sneezed. Oh, it's just so, oh, I'm so in love. You know, and the guy sitting there saying, wow. 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 It's all I can, wow. You hang up first. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. You didn't hang up. You didn't do it. I just love that stuff. There's so much passion. And so it's like, you know, you can't wait. You'll do everything you can to be in their presence. Everything. You'll look for every kind of way you can possibly, you know, I mean, it doesn't make no, you'll give up sleep. You'll give up food. You'll get skinnier than you ever thought you'd ever get. You'll get muscular more than you ever thought you would. I heard a thing the other day. They said that men after 55 years old give up on working out. They just give up on it. They finally come to the place of saying, what's the use? What's the use? Women, they hold on until they're a little older. Because they say, there might be a reason. There just might be a reason. You understand what passion is, don't you? You understand how passionate we get? But here's the thing. Are you passionate about Jesus? You say, well, Pastor, you say this a lot. You hear this a lot in sermons that we preach and things that we say. But the truth is, are we really passionate? Uh, you, you can tell what a person's passionate about by the things or the people they're willing to invest their time and energy in. passionate about Jesus, you'll spend time in his word. You'll spend time in his house. You'll spend time doing things that his word tells you to do. If you're passionate about Jesus, then you see the things that you're investing, the time and the energy. And here's the thing, I'm telling you, you can say what you want to say. And people can argue with me. They argue with me about this. They tell me, oh, pastor, come on. I'm telling you, take a look at where you spend your time. What do you spend the bulk of your time doing? Because I'm going to tell you something. If you spend the bulk of your time and your energy doing things for you, guess who sits at the center of your heart? You do. Are you passionate about things? You see, the more time and energy that we invest in the things and others, the more passionate we'll become about them. When, and this is the thing, where are you with Jesus? Are you passionate about Him? Do you invest a lot of time and energy in your relationship with Him? And I know, I know how we are. I mean, let's face it. If you're in a relationship with a, with a, with a young man or a young woman, you're going to spend a whole lot more time prettying yourself up than you would normally after you got married. Now, 
don't look at me like that because you know it's true. I mean, before you got married, you would tell your mama, Mama, make sure that you tell me when it's 6 o'clock because my boyfriend is coming at 7 and I need an extra hour just in case. So when he gets there at 7, just tell him to be patient. I'll be down in a few minutes. And you know what five minutes is to a woman? To a man, it's eternity. Right? Especially when you're waiting. But oh, my Lord, when she comes out the door, your jaw just drops. And she did, just to think, she did all that for you. See? Why? She's passionate about you. All right? You're passionate about her. I mean, you go out, you're going on a date, you go out and you get the car cleaned up. Right? You vacuum it, you wax it, you spit shine it, right? You get it all fixed up real nice. You pull up in the pull up in the driveway if you're not driving your mama's car. If you're still driving mama's car, it's a little different. But even if it is, if it was mama's car, you're still gonna clean it up for mama, because mama, I'll clean your car up this week. I'll even put gas in it. Right? I'm passionate, right? You get married. There is like dead French fries laying in the back seat. You got, you got McDonald's, right, piled up in the floorboard of the car, right? You walk in and think, oh, man, what is that smell? It was a dirty diaper. You forgot that your wife changed and stuffed it down there. You forgot all about it, right? Right? All that changes, right? But when you're passionate, man, you're, you say, but life happens. Yes, it does. And that's the point. That's the whole point about being a believer. Life does happen. And that's why you have to guard your heart that you keep the passion and keep it going. Because here's the thing. If you're not passionate about your wife, there'll be somebody out there that will be. If you're not passionate about your relationship, there is someone that will be. And what will happen, I'm going to tell you something. And if you don't keep the fire burning in your heart for the things of God, the enemy's got a way of bringing everything else that will make you passionate about it. And you'll lose it before you know it. The passion will be gone and you'll have nothing left and you won't even know it. You won't even know it. Because here's the thing, not only are you not, you finding yourself not passionate about the things of Christ, but then you find yourself treating your faith like it's a have to and not a get to. I have to do this. Well, I have to go to church because, you know, if I don't go to church, the pastor, you know, he keeps attendance and, you know, and the pastor's going to know it. And, if, you know, he'll be asking me, where were you Sunday? Well, you know, I have to go ahead and I've got to be in there because, you know, if I, don't go, if I don't show up to my class, if I don't show up to those things, everybody's going to be watching. They'll be saying, what have you been doing? Where have you been? Because the clipboard is going to be out marking everything you have and have not done this week. And we treat things like we have to do it instead of the, the, the truth is, is that we get to do it. We get to do it. Reading the Bible becomes something we get to do. But see, here's the thing. Some people read the Bible like they read the phone book. They only go to the select verse whenever they need it just to find a number. I need something, so I'm going to go find me a verse to fix it. See, do you treat participation in the life of the church like something that, that needs to be done or, 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 or you don't get into trouble because you didn't do it? If so, then I'm going to tell you something. You have it all wrong. See, Christianity is not about lay, lay, laying upon people a burden of religious duties or moral obligation. It is based upon a relationship you have with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something. The truth is, and here's the thing. There are times when people, just like Chelsea did and, and Elvin did to me one Sunday a, couple weeks, a few weeks back, I don't go to people all the time and ask them to do something. Many times people come to me and say, you know what, I really want to do something. I really want to do it. Now, one of the things I have discovered about one of the giftings that God has given me is that, you know what, I can pretty much tell, pretty much tell where a person probably is going to work well and what or not. And generally speaking, what we try to, what we try here to do is we try to find out what is it, what are you passionate about, what, where, what areas do you really love to do the work of the kingdom in. Because that's going to play a key role in whether or not you'll stay with something or you'll leave it. Amen. Amen. Because you know what? If you're, not, if you're not passionate about kids, they will kill you. 
It only takes one time. Could you take these kids to the bathroom? I would say something, but I'm not going to. I was just thinking a thought about what my grandson does sometimes at, at daycare. He had told people at daycare this week, he told them that, that, that my, name, my name is Pastor, but my nickname is Papa. I love that. You understand, if you're not passionate about it, if you're not, if you're not connected to it, if that, then what you'll do is, well, I'm only doing it, you know, well, they asked me to do it, so I'm going to do it. They, they, they didn't have nobody else, you know. Here's the thing, what I've come to, here, I've come to the conclusion of this. If nobody wants to do it, it don't need to be done. Amen. Because unless God raises somebody up to fill the spot, it don't need to be done. People say, well, how come we don't do this and how come we don't do that? My thing is not how come we don't do it. My thing is how come we're not asking God to raise up people to do it? How come that we've got to a place to where that all of a sudden it's no longer about, oh, I, I get to do ministry. Oh, man, I can't wait. To the point where it's, well, you know what, I got to, it's five o'clock, I got to go to that meeting in an hour, oh, why did I ever sign up for this? Do you understand? Christianity is not a religious have to. Christianity is a relationship, folks. You know the difference between Muslims and Christians and their prayer life? Because Christians pray because they want to pray. Muslims pray because they have to pray. They have to pray five times a day. Nobody's twisting your arm and telling you you ought to pray five times a day. But if you have a relationship with God, prayer should be a part of what you do. Amen. It should never be an issue when we talk about prayer. It ought to be a part of our life. Man, I get to pray. There's power when I pray. God does stuff when I pray. Things happen when I pray. I want to pray. My family needs me to pray. People need me to pray. My friends need me. I want to pray. I want to hear from God. I want to do what God called me to do. People change jobs and ministry like they change their clothes. Because they don't do it. Because they know they love to do it. They do it because they have to do it. You see, the thing is that I look at ministry a lot differently, I'm sure, because I get to do the thing that I've always wanted to do my entire life. I can, I can tell you, not that, I, not that I'm always happy, all right? I'm not always happy. But I can tell you this. I hear somebody laughing over there. Is that my wife? My wife's over there laughing. <laughs> Honey, you can't sit in the front row no more if you're going to act like that. I'm going to make you sit back there. But no, you can't even sit by Sarah. or You can't sit by none of those the women you're buying right now. They're just agging you on. There's times when I'm not happy. There's times when things don't go the way I, I'd like them to. There's times when, I, when things don't happen in the manner that I was hoping that they would happen. Or even sometimes even the way that I prayed that I wanted them to happen the way I prayed. But the one thing I can tell you unequivocally is I praise God every day that I get to do what I'm doing because I get to preach. I get to do the work of God. I get to be a part of the kingdom's work. And as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing greater in life. I remember as a kid growing up in, in, in grade school, you know how everybody in, in school, they always ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did you ever get that question asked to you when you was a kid? What do you want to be when you grow up? How many of you remember what it was you wanted to be when you grow up? Raise your hand. Hold your hand. Come hold it up. Way up. Way up. Way up. Hold it way up. All right? Now let me ask you a question. How many of you are doing what you wanted to do when they asked you that question when you were a child? How many of you are doing it right now? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Five, five people raised their hand. Out of all the rest of you that raised your hand. Only five. See, when I was growing up in school, they, they asked me, I wanted, I wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to be a preacher. In fact, when people used to, when we used to have career, job career days at school, remember those? Whenever I would talk about jobs, I would talk about my dad's job. Because my dad, I said, my dad's got the best job in the world. My job, job is more important than the president's job. 
right. I was telling them, my dad, they said, what does your dad do? I said, my dad is a minister of the gospel, and when he preaches, it's heaven or hell. <laughs> President can't even do that. But my dad can't. My dad's a preacher of the gospel. And when he gets up there to preach, buddy, you're either, you're either in or you're out. It's one or the other. I said, I always wanted to be a preacher. Because with me, it was never gray. It was always black and white. You see, when you get to do what you're passionate about, when you get to do the thing you love, the thing you care about, the thing that's, that drives you, it's what gets you up in the morning. You don't need three alarm clocks to get you up in the morning. Amen. Amen. You don't need it. You just want to do it. You're looking for ways to do it. You're looking for opportunities to do it. You're looking for all the things. That, and so you've got to, you, but you understand that if you find yourself in a place where I have to do this, then you've got to be careful because you know what? You're on a road to spiritual deadness. Number four, one other thing you need to see about this, and this is so important. You close your eyes to the mission of Jesus. You close your eyes to the mission of Jesus. When you close your eyes to the mission of Jesus, now, now, now you understand. Do you really, honestly care about the people around you? You know, you're walking out there. You're supposed to be alive. The Bible's we read it in First Corinthians, right? He made you what? Alive. But when you walk outside these doors today, you're walking out into a world that is cursed with death. There is death everywhere. And you have no idea, I have no idea that the people that I rub shoulders with tomorrow or this afternoon or this evening, I have no idea whether or not that this could be the very last opportunity that they ever hear about God or it's the very first opportunity they've ever heard about God. I don't know. I don't know. They tell a story, a true story that happened to D.L. Moody. Some of you have probably heard this. Back in the 1800s, how many of you remember the, reading in your history book about the Chicago Fire? Remember the Chicago Fire? Thousands of people. They, it's estimated like $200 million or $200 billion in damages is what in our day and time would, would, would have amounted to, is that, that fire that, that, that took Chicago. Just prior to that, just prior to that fire taking place, D.L. Moody had held a service in the church. And he got up to preach, and during that sermon, he was preaching, and, 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 he, and during that, come to the conclusion of his message, he didn't give people a chance to respond to receive Christ. And he just told them, he said, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow night when we come together, I'll give you an opportunity. And so they dispersed. That fire broke out. Many of the people that were, many of the people that were in that service died that night during that fire. And D.L. Moody made a promise to himself and to the Lord. He said, never again will I ever allow an opportunity to go by that I don't give somebody an opportunity to find Christ. Because you never know what might happen. You never know what might take place when you leave their presence. You have no idea what assignment is that God has got you on at that moment if you're not listening to him. You see, you've got to understand the mission. The mission is not for you to have a better house or to drive a better car. All those things are fine, but it's not, that's not what it's about. It's not about us building a nicer building. It's not about none of it's about are we going to be on mission with Christ? Because if we're missing the mission with Christ, if we're missing if we're missing it, if all we're doing, listen, if all we're doing is showing up and teaching our class, if all we're doing is just filling in the gap because nobody else will do it. If all we're doing is well, I'm just doing it because you know I'm just buying time. You know what? Get out of it. Don't do it no more. Just don't do it. Because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting the people around you. Because spiritual deadness is like a disease. And it, it, it'll, it'll spread. It'll spread throughout the people that you minister to. Because when they don't see the passion in your heart, and they don't see the drive in your heart, and they don't see that you're on mission with God, they're going to assume that that's the way it's supposed to be. And before long, what you have is you have a reputation that you're alive, but God says you're dead. Spiritual deadness is a horrible thing to happen to your life. You see, if you're spiritually dead or on the move to spiritual deadness, you'd rather see your church die than to see it grow or change. You'd rather see the church die. Why? Because you're spiritually dead. There's a lot of things I wanted to say about this, this particular moment in the message. 
But I'm going to tell you something, church. It would be devastating if this church died. Amen. You might not think that. You might not believe that, but I do. Why? Because I believe God brought us here for this purpose. And I'm going to tell you something. There are some, they could care less whether the church lives or dies. You know that every month over 3,000 churches close their doors in America. Did you hear what I said? 3,000 churches close their doors every month in the United States. Some of you say, I didn't even know there were that many churches out there. There are less people going to church right now than there were in the early 1900s. There are less people attending church today. In fact, at the rate of growth of the population, it will not be long until there will hardly be churches available for people to attend. If we continue on the course that we're on right now. But here's the thing I know. God always has a people. God will always have a church. God will always have a people that are passionate about Him, that love Him, that are called by His name. And God will always raise those ones up, and they will do what others will not do. Amen. That's what God does. That's how He does it. But I'm telling you what, there are some, amen, that just believe that, you know what, the church is old hat, the church doesn't have any place, and they turn, listen, the church, the church is not to be a concert hall. The church is not, the church is not to be, listen, you understand, that's not what it's about. It's a part of it, but it's not what it's about. The Bible, listen, the Bible didn't say, how shall they hear unless they hear a singer sing it? Or how shall they hear unless a puppeteer gives a puppet message? And how shall they hear unless they hear it preached? It has to be preached. Can the singer sing it? Yes. Can he preach it while he's singing it? Yes. But you know what it has to be? It has to be. Caleb, you got to do it because you you know, I get to do this. Not, I got to do this again. It has to be that. It has to be in children's ministry. It has to be. I get to, I get to preach the message today through a puppet. I get to give this message today through a song. I get to give this message today. I get to do the work. I get to go out. We had a rummage sale yesterday. Sister Kay had a rummage sale. you got to do a rummage sale. Not, well, we have to do a rummage sale because, you know, we don't have any money. and We've got to raise some money. And if we don't raise no money, you know, the poor widows out there. Don't have, no, we get to raise money for the widows' home. We get to raise money to help people who are in need. We need to do this. Our passion level drives us. Every, it's what gets us up in the morning. It's what drives us out the door. It's what keeps us talking to people about God. It's what helps me when I walk down the school hallways and I pass by the lockers of my friends and there they are talking about suicide and death. But here I am. I'm one who is alive. It's what drives me to say, i got an answer for you. i got a hope. It's in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. That if we would do this, if we would somehow recognize this and recognize that, you know what, yeah, there will be some changes that will have to be made. And yes, there may be some things we have to rid ourselves of and get rid of. But you know what? We do that because we don't want to die. We want to live. We want to live. We want to live. As a church, we want to live. As a person, I want to live. I want to spiritually be alive. I don't want to be dead. I don't want to go through the motion. I want to know that what I'm doing makes a difference and it counts. So I do it all my heart. When I find myself, Pastor Dan, I find myself at a place where that sometimes things are not really what I'd like them to be then I need to know that I've got another brother out there that can join hands with me and say, Pastor, friend, I want you to know that I'm going to stay with you and we're going to be more passionate than ever. And when, and when, we're, when you're down, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to love you through it. I'm going to help you and I'm going to make sure that the work of the kingdom of God doesn't stop. But see, spiritually, you've got to start. I, I bring this to your attention 
because it's dangerous to be spiritually dead. Because you'll be walking around thinking you're alive and you're not. And that's a dangerous place to be. Stand to your feet, everybody, all across the place. Bow your heads with me for a moment. Father, right now, there's some things we have to do right now. One of those things, God, is that we have to take some real close self-examination of our hearts. There has to be a moment, God, where we look and we look deep within ourselves. Because here's the thing, God. If we understand this story correctly, if we understand this event that took place in Sardis, and today, God, Sardis is nothing more than an archaeological dig. That's all it is. And today there's only a very few, there's still just a very few remaining believers that are are positioned there in Sardis. It is literally, when we look at Sardis, God, it is literally a living example of what happens when you spiritually die. Church is nothing but ruins. Now the warning for us is this, we have to be watchful. You told Sardis to be watchful be vigilant don't be spiritually asleep but be spiritually watchful look out for the attack of the enemy be watchful that the enemy would come you gotta we gotta watch as a church we gotta watch as people and then we gotta also God watch and make sure that we look for the coming of the Lord we have to be ready God because at any moment you can come we have to strengthen those that remain Strengthen the believers. Strengthen one another. We gotta realize, God, that we gotta, we don't have a lot of time. We have to act fast. We have to, we have to awaken our hearts. We have to recognize where we are. And we have to come alive again. We have to. Because the work is unfinished. The work is unfinished not done. It's not over yet. You've not come. You're not, you're not here yet. And while we remain, God, we have to be about your business. The only way, God, for us to do that is that we have to remember what we were and repent of what we are. We have to remember what we were when we first came to you. And we have to repent, God, of where we are. Because, God, we know that the imminent end is in sight. And we cannot continue on the course that we're on. And we cannot allow spiritual deadness to take root into our heart. We must not allow it. But instead to remember what it was like when we first came to you, when our passion levels were high, when you were to us today. God is calling us as his church and he's saying, I want you to remember. I want you to remember when I first enlightened your heart. I want you to remember when I first called you. I want you to remember when I first put my my, my, my life into you and I breathed into you that breath of life that brought your spirit man alive. I want you to remember what it was like when you were passionate about me and when you were driven to do the work of the kingdom of God and when you didn't care what other people thought about you. When the thing that really matters is that all you want to do is do what God called you to do because you get to do what God asked. He says, I want you to repent because you know what? If you're not as passionate about it today as you were then, you need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent because if you don't repent, he says, I'm going to come. He says, I'm going to come like a thief. And I'm going to come like a thief into your midst. And this is not this is not the second coming he's talking about. He is simply talking about judgment. I'm going to come with judgment on the church for failure to do what I ask. So he says, you need to be watchful. You need to be watchful. And it's more than just having a revival meeting. It means that I'm going to let God take my heart, change my life, do what needs to be done so that I can be passionate about him again. I don't want to be dead. I want to be alive. 
So I'm calling you as a church body. I'm calling you as believers today who will say, you know what, the one thing I want, I want to be alive in Jesus more today than I've ever been before. That's what I want. And if that is in your heart this morning, I'm going to ask you to get out from where you're standing, come with your hands raised up to Him. And just as a unified body of believers, that we just commit our heart to God and say, God, I do not want to be guilty of spiritual death. I want to be alive, God. I want my passion to be greater than it's ever been. I want to thank you, God, that I get to do ministry. I want to thank you, God, that you called me for this time. I want to thank you, God, that I can be alive in you and that you've given to me the hope I have and that, God, you called me to reach out to everyone else around me. And, God, that I'm not going to wait for somebody else to do it. I'm going to do it because, God, I know that's what you want of my life. That's what I know. That's what I know, God. I want your fire to fall fresh on my heart. I want my life, God, to be what you want it to be. Oh, God, I pray in Jesus' name. I don't ever allow my circumstances or the things that have happened to me, God, to dictate how my future is going to turn out. I want you to take me, God, where you want me to be. I want to grow the way you want me to grow. I want you to do in me, God. What, oh, God, I am so thankful that you have called me out of my darkness and you brought light to me, God. Oh God, I am so grateful to you this morning. God, that you love us enough to warn us. You love us enough to call us. You love us enough, God, to speak your word into our heart. You care about us enough. Oh God, you don't want us just to have a reputation. You want us to be real. We don't want to be people that just carry around a title. We really want to be what you said we're supposed to be, God. Come on, raise those hands to him right now. And just let him speak to your heart right where you are. Come on, let him talk to you about your own life, about the things in your heart. Let him, let him, let, let the word that we spoke this morning, the things that are going on, let those things, let those things come into your heart. Let him, let him speak to you. Let him speak to you. Are you treating your faith like it's routine? Or have you really poured into it? Has it become a passion of your heart? Do you treat your faith like you have to do it? Or are you glad you get to do it? Where are you? Where are you in this? Where are you in this? Where are you in this? Do you treat, listen, are you close to the mission? Or are you passionate about the mission? Are you passionate about the mission? Are you passionate about what God called you to do? Oh, God, let me be. I don't want to close my eyes to the mission of what you called me to do. I do not want, God, I don't want to wait for somebody to come in the door. I want to go outside. I want to go into the highway and byway and compel men and women, young people, children to come to you, God. I want to do whatever we can to take the gospel to where everybody is, God. That's what I want to do. That's what I, I've got a story to tell, God. I've got a story to tell. I've got a testimony, God. I've got a word, God. You put into my life. You brought me out of these places. You've given me hope. You've shown me, God, that it's not over yet. You've given me life, God. God, the only thing I'm waiting on is I'm waiting on your return. And so, God, what I'm waiting on your return. I'm going to do everything I can, God. I'm going to give myself to everything you ask me to give to. It. I'm going to pour my heart and my life, God, into this. This, this is what it's all about. This is all that matters. Nothing else matters but you. Nothing else matters but you. Nothing else matters but what you call me to be. Nothing else matters, God, but what you've given into my spirit to do in these last days. Shut up, I don't know 
preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the broken heart, to set the captive free. See, it's that, that it's that anointing oil that flows on our lives. Oil, you know, oil does a lot of things. Oil brings healing. Oil is used to start fire. Oil, oil, you understand? Oil is a is a is an agent that 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 we use, but sometimes we don't even realize the, the power of the oil. The power of the anointing that comes into your life. Yes, yeah, you've got scars, but God's anointing is on you. Yes, I've been bruised, but God's anointing is upon me. Yes. I've been crushed. How do you think the oil came out? It couldn't have happened if I hadn't been crushed. It couldn't have happened had I not gone through what I grew and through. But look at the joy of the Holy Spirit, the wine, the new wine, the fresh wine that comes, the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The wine from heaven that falls. And he said, listen, and listen what he says. And he says this, you can't take new wine and put it into old wine skins. Right? So what does he do? He takes our old life and he what? Makes it new. He makes it new so that he can pour in the new wine, the fresh wine, the best he saved for last. Oh man. Oh man. Oh man. Oh God. I get to do ministry. I thank you, God, that I have been called by your name. I thank you, God, that you have anointed me, God, to do the work that you called me to do. And I'm going to do it with all my heart. Actually, God, I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> Caleb, sing it one more time. Sing it out. Church, sing it with him. God, thank you, because I know, God, today I've been moved by you, God. I've been moved by your spirit, God, in my life. Oh, God, I thank you, because I know, God, I know you've got something, God, you want to do it. God, you're taking us to a new place in you. Well, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. 